Welcome to this video lecture on policy making process and policy evaluation. In this lecture, we're overviewing uh, some of the material that we've looked at in earlier in the course and taking a deeper look at it uh, in terms of policy as a process, so looking specifically at an aspect of policy as a process, and also some of the evaluation techniques that are used in understanding policy. Starting with policy as a process, the process is uh, relatively specific. It's explained in the Peters text, um, and it's sort of sequential. Uh, we look at policy as uh, this sequential process where at first uh, the steps that are identified here on the slide you identify a problem. Then you set an agenda, and part of setting that agenda is mobilizing support for your what you think is important. Remember, in policy we're talking about what government does and what it doesn't do, and often what government chooses to do and chooses not to do. And we assume that government can do almost anything. There's an unlimited amount of things that government can do, conceptually, but government makes choices. It does not do everything. It only does some things. So the question becomes, why do some things come to the front of government in terms of importance? Why do they get ranked higher by government in terms of importance and actually make their way through uh, to actual policy legitimation and implementation? How do they become policy? And why do other things that government could do fall by the wayside. Sort of what gets up, you know, what sort of percolates to the top in terms of ideas and priorities. And early on, very early on in this course, we looked at government spending as one way to descriptively at least understand what might be priorities by government. When government spends most of its money, for example, as the United States federal government does, on social welfare, supporting social welfare, we assume that that is some indication that government, the federal government in the United States, prioritizes social welfare, like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. We also see that the federal government in the United States, which is very different from many other countries, uh, spends a decent amount of its annual budget um, in fiscal year 2013, around 18% on defense. So we can say that there's some prioritization of defense in the United States, that that is something that the United States prioritizes amongst other things. And again, we're only using as our evaluative measure what government actually spends. But the point here in looking at the policymaking process, we can say there are many, many different types of problems, identification of a problem, many different kinds, uh, unlimited even, uh, different things that can be identified as a problem depending on uh, the criteria you're using to determine it as a problem, to identify it as a problem. And then the question of setting an agenda, the notion of mobilizing support really speaks to the idea of getting a consensus or building support or consensus for your idea. Getting other people to support the notion that your idea is more important than many of the other potential ideas that are out there. But that is in essence setting an agenda, you mobilize support. And then you legitimize. Legitimize, uh, we talked about uh, in the previous video lecture, for example, and earlier in the course, we talked about some of the models of policymaking. Legitimization, um, if we were to use, you know, uh, the, the, the foundational model uh, of, you know, the separation of powers and Congress or the legislature uh, being sort of, uh, you know, policy creation by law, then, you know, the formal legitimization, usually in most governments, is when that legislative body or Congress passes a law. That's when something gets legitimized. An idea or a concept becomes law. The fact that it is law, it takes on our, it, it now has all of the characteristics of what we define as law and all of the rights and uh, sort of special attributes that now apply to it. It can be enforced it's an expectation put on the public, that sort of thing. That's one way that we can look at this notion of legitimization. And as far as we're, when we look at policy as a process, not as a thing or an output, but as a process. Um, and then there's implementation, the next step, which is once you have, for example, a law, a legitimized policy, you need to actually implement it. Most of you should be, at least in your head now, identifying the hierarchy of law as, as a way of trying to sort of structure 
this and saying, oh yes, I, I, I remember here that we have this, you know, Congress or the legislature is responsible for the L's in our hierarchy of law, the CLR, and uh, that's the, you know, legislation or laws. And then there's that delegation to the R's or regulations. And regulations often are the, the at least the legal means by which uh, there's an implementation of this legislative will of policy, right? formalized policy. So there's implementation, and often the executive branch, if we were to separate again, implements law. And then there's an evaluative aspect to policymaking as a process. And in the evaluation, uh, you analyze to determine its overall effectiveness. How effective was this policy? Right? Is, it, is it meeting its objectives? There's many different ways uh, that we can look at that. And evaluation actually is a, an area or category that we focus on a bit in a separate chapter in this course. And it's something you'll be doing, those of you in the MPP program, for example, you'll be getting into different ways of uh, different forms of evaluation. And there's a number of examples that are provided in the course materials, other video links, etc., cetera, uh, to give you examples of evaluation, other readings as well. But if we break this down now, we can get into a little bit of deeper discussion on each of these areas of the policymaking process. We think of agenda setting. You know, large scale, we can, we can conceptualize, and maybe we're using models here with these two triangles and arrows, but we're, we're trying to sort of simplify a little bit. And we're thinking about, you know, how agendas get set in large scale. They really get set in two ways. There's a bottom-up approach, uh, the notion that, you know, um, this mass opinion helps to form and shape policy, right? Uh, so people get ideas, those ideas, and at least in our sort of representative system, there's a sort of a critical mass where there's a large scale public support and maybe opinion polling helps to identify that support. Um, something recently, in, the, in recent years, that's really sort of gained a groundswelling of public support has been, um, you know, uh, what is often termed gay marriage or equal equal marriage opportunities uh, for people from various backgrounds, right? Same-sex marriage, those sort of things. Um, that's really gaining support over the last number of years. And one can say that maybe that's an example of a bottom-up approach where most of that support and groundswelling support comes from grassroots. Uh, it's dispersed across the country and there's this movement and understanding that comes from the bottom the masses, and it sort of percolates itself or its way up toward the top. Of course, we have no universal standard, at least in 2000, beginning of 2015, um, but we can see that there's sort of a, we've definitely passed a certain threshold and are likely moving in a, quickly in a direction where the majority of states recognize it in the federal court system right now. Uh, there's a strong recognition of it, and at the federal level, there's a recognition of it. So you can see where this, this critical mass is happening. But if you think about it and look historically at the evolution, it seems like very much like a bottom-up approach. Another example, uh, civil rights. Uh, many argue that the civil rights movement was very much a bottom-up approach, where it wasn't government demanding certain things. Although, again, historically, one could argue that, well, if we think of the Civil War as one of the starts to the civil rights, and that was, you know, so the Emancipation Proclamation uh, by Abraham Lincoln, uh, some could argue that that is a top-down example where there was this identification at the very top before there was um, popular, and when I say popular, there certainly was a public support uh, for equality. Uh, way back in the 1800s here in the United States, but it wasn't necessarily um, a, major a majority. And certainly there was a difference of opinion probably between citizens, say, in the Northeast uh, versus the South in the United States at that time for a variety of reasons. Um, but so we can see, you know, there's some argument that, well, maybe that was, you know, government at large establishing more of a top-down approach. There was this declaration and that then, you know, set an expectation of how, you know, the federal government, you know, established law, that law created certain rights, and then it sort of percolated down. Um, but others that look at it sort of in the, at least the, in the um, 20th century, identify that much of the civil right movement uh, was shown as a bottom-up approach. We think of Martin Luther King, we think of uh, Medgar Evers, we think of Rosa Parks, we think of these examples of individuals that weren't necessarily deeply connected and uh, certainly weren't representatives in government elected officials. Uh, working hard amongst uh, mass group organizations to help establish 
uh, marches and other demonstrations, sit-ins, etc., ways of sort of opening up the public's eye to the issue of inequality and civil rights and how that over time uh, played a significant role in moving uh, civil rights onto the agenda uh, at the national, both state level and national level. But again, uh, more recently, uh, the example of equality, marriage equality, we can see that certainly happening. And it's mostly happening at the state level, which is quite interesting. And what I mean is that you can see how there's sort of these examples within each uh, area. There's some political and social ideological differences between uh, populations within states. I mean, you can see how there's sort of this sort of uh, almost like a, a wave of support that develops over a period of time, but most of that emanates from the bottom. So large scale, often we can identify how agendas get set either from bottom up approaches or top down approaches. And here, opinion shaping, uh, policy shaping. Again, is it mass opinion that shapes policy or is it policy that shapes mass opinion? And that's an interesting uh, way of thinking about how agendas get set. A lot of people, at least on the conspiracy thought side, I'm sorry, conspiracy theory side of the spectrum, often uh, wonder about how ideas get placed into um, the populace's uh, minds. And today, with uh, e easy access to distributed information, it used to be back then, uh, back a number of years ago, that uh, your newspaper or there were just a few news services. And there was a fear that uh, those who control that information uh, could sort of manufacture sort of a public consent over time um, by just giving you specific snippets of information. Uh, today we have a much more distributed form of information sharing, uh, not only with the official news services, but with all kinds of social uh, networking and interactions uh, with the sort of loosening up of the internet and the socializing of the internet. But uh, again, so agenda setting, we can think about it in two large terms, both the bottom up approach and the top down approach. And then we can sort of query and wonder about the role of opinion shaping policy or policy shaping opinion, that kind of thing. In both of these instances, we can also consider the role of the media. What role does the media play? And I just gave you an example where maybe historically um, uh, there was uh, some argument that the media could play a significant role. If you haven't seen Citizen Kane, maybe uh, you know, it's a classic movie, but uh, that's a suggestion that, you know, in, in some ways uh, that the media can have a significant role in a public opinion. Uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, back in, the, I believe, the late 1980s, um, wrote a, an interesting book called Manufacturing Consent. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you might want to look that up. Um, again, the role of the media uh, in moving uh, individuals to support or not support a particular um, ideology. Uh, but the media does play a significant role. And maybe that role is diminishing or maybe it's simply changing nowadays with more distributed forms of uh, information sharing. Um, you know, and by the way, when you have more uh, opportunities to share information, you definitely get into the scenario where, you know, not all uh, information is equal. You know, opinions and facts are, you know, <laughs> opinions formulated through facts can be quite helpful many times, um, educated opinions, um, but there's no shortage of opinions out there and some of them completely unsupported, many of them actually completely unsupported by any factual basis. And one helps to wonder how you get people to uh, agree to your idea and the uh, underlying legitimacy, maybe, of the idea. But the media certainly plays a significant role. Legitimization. The role of the legislature, and we can think about this again within that context of legitimization is the passage of law, like the official legitim legitimization. There are unofficial, there are all kinds of, you know, uh, non-official actors and policy making. There's all models to sort of discuss that. But here, uh, just to understand the sort of like uh, bread and butter, you know, basic and, and clear and official forms of legitimization in terms of public policy, we're looking at the role of the legislature. And, um, you know, like I said, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, and you certainly learn more uh, details about this in administrative law, but the legislature does uh, its legitimizing through creating laws. And if you think about that, the lawmaking process, you know, there's the old saying, and this is where the political scientists really sort of um, have a, uh, an important role in understanding public policy is that um, the lobbying efforts, the, you know, legis legislation is very much like making, uh, <laughs> what is it, making sausage, right? It's a messy process. Um, but the question becomes, you know, how do um, representatives, um, how do they formulate their opinions? Who are they listening to? Um, what is their primary interest? Uh, 
Are they most, uh, do they care most about their constituency? Is their constituency clear? For example, you know, is maybe it's a lot clearer for a uh, House of Representative member who uh, represents a small district within a state. Uh, maybe the ideology of that district, of the people that live in that small district, are relatively uniform. Uh, but maybe it's much more difficult for a senator, a U.S. senator, for example, who represents the entire state, uh, which could have a significant difference in terms of ideology between different areas of the state. The point is, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult for these representatives to know exactly what their constitu constituency wants well, or what's best for their constituency. Um, one of our forms of, some argue our form of representative government is, is there so that the representative can be the specialist and uh, sort of a parent-child relationship in some ways with uh, constituencies in the sense that the representative knows best, right? And so it's not necessarily doing something that the constituency wants because maybe they don't know exactly what's best for them. So the representative's job is to do what's best overall for their constituency. And of course, that's a normative term and we can have an argument about what is best and how do you define that term and who are you talking about? But certainly those that speak loud uh, definitely have some sway. And what I mean by that is uh, lobbying, for example. And here, lobbying and special interest efforts most apparent at this stage. Uh, political action committees, for example, you know, and, um, and we've had some interesting policy developments. Um, I think, you know, Citizens United, uh, U.S. Supreme Court opinion of the last few years, has really opened up uh, the role of money or funding, right, um, in, in terms of um, elections and uh, election campaigns. So now that uh, First Amendment free speech rights, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, apply to non-humans, <laughs> these entities, then now there's a, there's a lot more uh, potential to have money and special interest influence in uh, the, at, at the forefront of what is interesting to uh, the House of Representative members, the Senate members, people that are elected, our elected representatives. You know, often if you uh, if you take a look, you'll see that many of our uh, elected officials spend a lot of their time in um, you know, raising funds, you know, and spending time with lobbyists and others, other special interests, uh, looking for funding uh, for their next campaign. And it's always an ongoing concern. And one has to consider the role that plays and how they prioritize issues. But um, in other words, what legislation actually what what makes it to a bill, for example, right? which would be a, a form of, a, of an agenda that's been established. And then uh, what kind, what of those bills have a greater chance of passing and becoming law, a legitimized policy? And see, these are some of the issues that we can consider when we think about the policymaking process. And then there's implementation. And again, if we use our hierarchy of law example, you think of the role of the executive. After the law is passed, the law must be implemented. It must be actually implemented. And implementation includes the enforcement of the law on society to ensure compliance. Um, the Internal Revenue Code is pretty substantial. Uh, all, most of us, because you know the two guarantees of life, death and taxes, most of us are exposed to the effects of the Internal Revenue Code or the requirements of it on a yearly basis, regardless of whether or not we're, I don't know if any of us are actually experts in the Internal Revenue Code, probably not. Uh, and that probably because it's thousands and thousands of pages long, if not tens of thousands. And it changes constantly, portions of a change, that sort of incrementalism change uh, to the Internal Revenue Code. But it's, it's very complicated. But the Internal Revenue Code, um, you know, Congress doesn't enforce it directly. Uh, they delegate that responsibility to the Internal Revenue Service, or the IRS, which is an executive agency, which actually is, you know, under the President of the United States. And their job, that, and that executive agency's job, is to uh, carry out the obligations mostly the collection and enforcement of tax obligations uh, to the citizens. And, but they also serve a, a servicing function, an important one, which includes you know, ensuring um, the collection of returns that not only include uh, the payment of taxes, but refunds, right? And credits and some other things that might apply for individuals and ensuring the disbursement of those funds properly to individuals. So the Internal Revenue Service has a very important role to play. And if they didn't play that role, if there was no implementation of the Internal Revenue Code as a policy, a legitimized policy via statute, if they didn't do that, then we might wonder how effective the Internal Revenue Code as a policy would be, right? It might be on the books. There might be the requirement to pay these taxes, but if there was no real enforcement mechanism, 
underway, many people might choose simply not to pay the tax if they can get around it, for example. Uh, and if those, so if that was possible, we might see that policy, because of its lack of implementation as what many call a paper tiger, uh, something that's been legitimized, at least effect, you know, legitimized in the sense that it's a law in the books, but is not legitimate in the sense that it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. I think recently we've had a change of stance. Um, many, a number of states now um, uh, have legalized marijuana, the possession and the distribution, and even the selling, uh, Colorado, for example, the selling of marijuana. And to, at this moment, as far as I can recall, early 2015, uh, the federal government, uh, it's still a felony in many cases uh, to certainly intend to distribute, to hold marijuana. There's a number of, of, of criminal acts that can be conducted as vis-a-vis -vis federal law regarding uh, what is effectively legal in state law, and there's a disconnect there. And one of the ways that's being dealt with at the moment is that I know the Attorney General has stated that um, for, in many of these cases, the federal government simply will not prosecute individuals in those states uh, for these potential federal violations that are A-OK -okay under state law. The point is here we have a disconnect, and it's an interesting uh, evolving situation in terms of policy evolution because you have a disconnect between state law and federal law on a topic. So the policy at the state level is different from the policy at the federal level, and there's potentially a conflict, at least in terms of how those two things are enforced and carried out by the executive, right? How they're implemented. And so to harmonize those things outside of the judiciary, the executive, at least at the federal level, is making the decision to not enforce aspects of this law to create harmony so that there's not a, uh, a potential conflict. But that conflict is still there. And the example provides us with some, some way of thinking about what implementation means in practice, right? So to the extent that the federal government no longer wishes to enforce valid criminal laws related to marijuana possession and distribution, um, the, it calls into question the actual legitimacy of the, those federal laws, right? Because again, they become paper tigers. If nobody's going to actually arrest you at the federal level and prosecute you at the federal level, then you have to question how valid that law really is. So we can see that, you know, uh, implementation is incredibly important because even though you might have a law that's become legitimized, you know, a, a, a policy that's become legitimized by, uh, via law, the lack of implementation can really sort of strip that policy of any of its real meaning. I think that's important to understand. And then there's policy evaluation, which is assessing the impact of policy, not simply the outputs. So evaluation is incredibly important because evaluation is the opportunity for us to think about, well, does this thing really work? Does it mean what we thought it would mean? Does it do what we thought it would do? Is it cost effective, right? Uh, does, it, does it yield us more benefits than what it costs us? And there's a number of ways, by the way, to, uh, to identify those costs and benefits. And in the policy analysis section, uh, the final subject area in this course, uh, the last module, in in Introduction to Policy Analysis, you'll you'll be exposed to cost-benefit analysis and some of the assumptions that are contained in that, in cost-benefit analysis, and some of the different ways of doing that. And, and uh, different examples uh, will be provided to you. And you'll actually take a course later, in, if you're in the MPP program, uh, to really get into uh, policy analysis in some detail. And it's really interesting because, again, um, I'm talking about evaluation here, evaluating. Um, not necessarily evaluation and analysis to me are very similar, but evaluation is distinct in some ways, or at least it's conceptually distinct in much of the academic literature and certainly in the textbook. Um, but when we think about evaluation, we're, we're going further than outputs, right? And we're looking at impacts. The example that is stated here is uh, mandatory testing in public schools, like No Child Left Behind, NCLV. And uh, now we have variations on that. But since 2001, we now have this sort of national standard uh, that's really incentivized uh, mandatory testing uh, of school, of children, school-age children at certain ages. And 
we might see that, you know, we might have a before and after, for example. And this actually is a real case. When we think about Houston, Texas, which really was the exemplar, right? The example situation the city of Houston had implemented essentially no child left behind type strategies uh, for a number of years in the mid to late 90s. And that really was the, the example uh, for the uh, passage and implementation of No Child Left Behind under uh, President Bush, uh, the second there, W, uh, in 2001. And a lot of the ways in which the, um, the benefits were measured under the Houston example was output orientated. Like they showed you, for example, graduation rates increase. So before no, you know, we'll just call it No Child Left Behind, before the Houston version of No Child Left Behind, graduation rates were low. After the implementation of the Houston version of No Child Left Behind, the graduation, I'm sorry, the graduation rates were much higher. And the question is, well, if we look at that output, there's a significant difference. So it must be that the No Child Left Behind type policy applied in Houston was the difference. It was the thing that made the difference. But if we look a little bit deeper, if we don't just look at output, we looked at impact, uh, we might look at something like net graduation effects. What I mean by that is, um, what is net? Well, I have down here, you can see why, because the dropout rates increased, artificially increasing graduation rates. In other words, if you don't look at the factors that are involved in yielding that different output, you might miss something really important, right? And effectively, what was found out years later, after No Child Left Behind was passed and, and placed into policy at the national level uh, in the mid-2000s, was that in Houston, what they were doing is they were just taking the low performing students and they were holding them back. So they kept holding them back a grade and then they continue to hold them back again. So, you know, I'm a 14 year old freshman and I didn't do so well. So I get held back as a freshman. And I'm a 15 year old freshman. Maybe I didn't do so well again. So I get held back yet again. Now I'm a 16 year old freshman. This is just an example. This is, and it's just an example for illustrative purposes. I'm not suggesting this actually existed in every instance. Um, and then, you know, I'm a, I'm a 22 year old sophomore, right? And I've been at this game for seven or eight years and I'm tired of it. So simply what happens is that I choose, even though the school has not officially removed me, right? Has not expelled me, let's say from, uh, from the school, I simply don't come back. I drop out and the dropouts are not, uh, they're not actually counted in our output, right? So the rates of graduation goes up. Why? Because you remove all of the people that would have been counted as non-graduates because you keep holding them back. You just simply don't allow them to get to the point where they're assessed as either a graduate or a non-graduate. And dropouts are not counted as people who do not graduate. So I hope that makes sense as an example. If you only look at outputs, then sometimes the policy seems, it can seem to be effective for a variety of reasons. The numbers can be, you know, really telling and really enticing. But if you dig beneath the surface and look for impact, that's really what policy evaluation is. It's about and policy analysis, really. Uh, it's about trying to really understand the effect by teasing out some of the background noise of what exactly is going on. Does this policy really make a difference? And if all No Child Left Behind did, at least at the state level in the Houston, the city of Houston, I should say, the city level example, if all that it did was increase dropout rates and get rid of students, didn't allow them to become seniors, those that would have had difficulty graduating, if that's all that it does, then that is not no child left behind, right? That is the antithesis. That is definitively leaving children behind. Uh, so that's one way to think about sort of policy evaluation. In terms of outputs, they're done through reporting and before after evaluations. These are great. You know, the example is we spent $3 billion on water quality projects this year. That's a statement of what was done. If we talked about, do you remember descriptive at the very beginning, the first video, uh, the first set of lectures of what is public policy? We talked about a descriptive policy and we use the federal budget as the example of a perfect descriptive policy. We know, you know, so many billions of dollars spent on, you know, Medicare each year. So many billions, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on defense. So many hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on social security. We know this, we can look at it, it's descriptive. And the question is, what does that mean? Well, it's a statement of what was done. So we have that, we know it's a statement, um, but it's just a statement of output before and after, you know? And uh, so uh, before and after is maybe the no child left behind example. Before graduation rates were 22% of seniors. After policy, graduation rates were 65% of seniors. We can see how that's 
seems wonderful, right? And it seems that it's incredibly valid because they're talking about seniors, right? That's okay, but did everyone make it to the senior year after the new policy was implemented? In other words, if you find an attrition rate that is significant among students that cannot, that, you know, say the attrition rate was 10% before the implementation of this policy of students moving from junior to senior year. And then after the policy, the attrition rate went from 10% to like 60%, right? <laughs> now you know, well, wait a second, we're losing a lot of those students that normally are counted as seniors. They're just not making it to the senior year. So that output reporting is deceptive. It's not really telling an accurate story. And if you don't know that, if, right, if, you're not, if you're not looking a little bit deeper, then the policy can seem incredibly valid to you and you want to support it. And sometimes just spending a lot of money can create validity. Oh, well, I see. We spent $450 billion on Medicare. Well, that's significant. That's a lot of money. That means we're doing something that matters. Well, yes, maybe, but maybe not. What if 40% or 50% of that money was going to Medicare fraud through inaccurate billing, for example, or inappropriate billing by doctor's offices, right? What if you found that out? Well, now all of a sudden, the actual money that's being spent, if we want to talk about money getting to the, the root of the problem, which is to support medical services of those of our elderly, right, or our disabled in terms of Medicaid and some others, but um, it... If, if the money's not being, if it's not being used for that purpose, it doesn't matter how much you're spending because a good portion of the pie is being used for illicit services, for example. So it's not really meeting its goal. Should be understandable. Cause and effect. Hard thing to do in evaluation is to determine whether or not the policy is the cause of a good outcome. An example, policy enacted to increase jobs. Jobs increase in the economy, but was that because of the policy or simply because the economy increased outside of the policy? This is hard to determine. So what we're saying here is, you know, you can correlate two things. You can say, oh, look, we implemented a new policy. And as we implement this policy, we notice that jobs have increased since the implementation of that policy. But as we should know, in any, you know, basic level understanding of statistics is that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. So it doesn't mean that that policy necessarily caused that job increase. And I'll tell you that um, many elected representatives, particularly presidents, because of the four-year terms and the potential for a second year, you know, a second term or eight year, many times presidents, they either enjoy many of the benefits of previous policy decisions that are just now coming to fruition. And often it makes the president look like a genius. And by the way, CEOs of companies enjoy this many times when they come on board. The, what I mean is that there's many times there's a sort of a, a lag between policy implementation and the actual impact that that policy is having. Not the output, but the impact. And sometimes by hap nothing more than happenstance, individuals that are put into positions of leadership enjoy that, you know, that opportunity where they move in and that lag is now ended and you can actually feel the effects of the policy. Those effects have very little and nothing to do with the new person in power and it's just a timing. It's just we see the person come to power and then we start seeing the effects of a policy that maybe was implemented a decade ago, for example, or years ago, well before this person was put into power. Now that person might take full political credit for all the good news that's happening, but they have very little to do with that good news. None of their policies, nothing, you know, they just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And this is what we mean by cause and effect, right? It's very hard to determine when something is caused by something else rather than simply correlating to something else. So, you know, and jobs is a great example, but there's many others. And so when we think about public policy and we think about evaluating public policy, Often we have to weed out what, we, what I would call noise, this, this notion of correlation that's not necessarily closely related. Now, many of you, at least those of you in the MPP program, you will be taking statistical analysis. When you take that course, you should focus on these things. This is exactly what it should be about. It should be about thinking about how can statistics, statistical analysis, how can some, you know, a little bit of math, a little bit of algorithms, right? How can these things help us? weed out the noise to see whether or not the actual policy is having a significant impact. It's actually an important factor in causing the, the thing that we see, the symptom, the circumstance that that, that that ends up being. There's something called the Hawthorne effect, and this is often termed in public policy when we think about policy evaluation. 
The Hawthorne effect suggests that results of new programs may be impacted by desire to show positive results. So this is bias. Another way, Hawthorne effect is a way of, of talking about bias if you want to use sort of a mathematical term. In the, or probabilistic, uh, you know, which is math, but also in uh, statistics. So the example is a new program to fight drugs. Money and emphasis places uh, focus on the program. So there's a new program. It's, we're going to combat drugs. We're going to throw a lot of money at it, and there's a lot of attention. Media is playing a role, right? There's a lot of people looking at this. There's a lot of focus on it. There are you know, hearings in Congress and all of that good stuff. And again, the media picks it up and then distributes it to the masses. So everybody's sort of attuned to this, this war on drugs, this new focus on drugs. And like I said, there's a lot of money, so there's this, this idea of emphasis being put on it. And then everybody wants to see it do well, because everybody's involved, right? Everybody has a role, and everybody has a, a potential stake in the outcome. Um, new agencies, uh, Homeland Security, for example, can be developed and created, right, and funded through this focus, uh, this new focus area. It's not necessarily drugs, but, you know, terror, right, national security, that sort of thing. And so everybody that's in, involved in that process, they all want to see it do well. They all want to see it have value. They all want to maintain its meaning. Why? Because it exists and their, you know, their livelihood, many of them, it's attached to what they're doing, right? So the head of Homeland Security, their job security is, is based on Homeland Security being absolutely necessary. Or the drug czar's, you know, position is, is related or drug enforcement agencies' positions, right, and funding are related directly to the value that they're adding in this war on drugs, for example. And then the question, again, the question from a policy evaluation standpoint, is whether the focus creates good results. You know, whether, whether that focus actually um, is, is helping us see what is really happening, what is really there from an evaluative, what are the real impacts, or are we sort of, you know, overshadowing it with a lot of sort of positive energy? Are we biased? towards favoring uh, the outputs that we see? Are we, are we willing to not delve too deep into the analysis to determine impact and simply look more towards outputs? Oh, well, that's good. You know, they've hired some new people. They've bought some new equipment. There's, you know, more boots on the streets. There's more people looking at this. That makes me feel good. Therefore, I think it's successful. Something like that, something superficial. The question is whether if you get good results, the need is to monitor the program over a long period of time, right, to see whether or not it's effective. Then there's relative versus absolute terms. This is something else to consider in terms of policy evaluation. In, evaluate, in evaluating a policy, the terms being used make a difference, so the actual terms that you're using. An example, a relative term, lowest 20% of incomes, right? So that, what's great about that term is that it's an apples to apples comparison, right? Because if you're talking about incomes in country A versus country B versus country C, all of those actual income amounts can be quite different. Country A could be, you know, average income is $100,000. Country B, average income is $50,000. Country C, average income is $25,000. It's very different. But if you're in relative terms, you're saying the lowest 20% of incomes, regardless of what the average income is. So that equalizes. You're going to get the lowest 20% of incomes in each country, regardless. Absolute terms, in terms of an evaluative measure, is very different. So, for example, less than $22,000 a year. Well, if we looked at less than $22,000 a year, you know, those three countries, countries A, B, and C, the actual people that are going to be capturing that is going to be very different than the lowest 20% of incomes. The proportion of the population in each of those countries is going to be very different with absolute terms than it is with relative terms. And so you need to ask yourself, under which definition, if used, can we actually end poverty, right? So in other words, do we look at the lowest percentages, for example, this is from a poverty example, right? Or do we look at just a certain dollar amount? And it's interesting because in the United States, poverty levels are usually, at least at the federal level, defined by an absolute number. You know, family of four making less than X amount of dollars per year. It's usually in the 20s. I think it's in the mid-20s now, 25, 24,000 dollars a year, which is, and you can also think about those absolute terms in relationship to geography. In other words, a family of four making $24,000 a year, let's say 25, something like that, to just beat the poverty. If you live in New York City, you're going to laugh, right? Um, you're going to say it's the cost of living here is a substantial. If you live in San Francisco, you're going to laugh. You're going to say $25,000 a year for four people is a joke. It's very expensive to live here. If you live maybe in the middle of the country in a small town, uh, it, maybe it's a much cheaper area than either New York City or San Francisco, for example. 
uh, maybe twenty-five thousand. Still not a lot of money, especially for a family of four. But but the actual livability might be different. And what I'm saying there is that even geographic differentiation within the same country creates an important relative term, right? A way of relationally thinking about poverty. Poverty matters where you are as well because of cost of living and affordability index, if you were to call it that, right? It changes based on your area. An area with the same amount of money might be much more affordable than another area, right? With the same amount of money. Um, so. Cost of living really matters. And so this is a, another way of, of, of trying to understand, well, look, if we're talking about poverty, if poverty is the issue here, then poverty is relative. It's relative based on how many people, right? A family of four for 25,000 versus an individual with $25,000 in their pocket, that sort of thing. Am I only taking care of myself? Do I have dependents, right? What's my earning capacity? Blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of factors to take into consideration. but. One way to sort of categorize that and think about it in larger sense, and this is all sort of a variant of modeling, is that we can think of things in relative versus absolute terms. So that's the end. Um, that's all that I think uh, the big, um, touching on the big issues here in this particular section. Uh, and uh, so we should have a good idea now of the policymaking process and some forms of evaluation and how they apply in understanding public policy. Thank you so much.